let us come together in our call to worship. In the midst of a world where people hunger and thirst, in the midst of a world where people are abused and oppressed, in the midst of a world filled with wars and rumor of war, in the midst of a world of spiritual emptiness, Join me now in our call to confession. Together, eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins, free us from the selfishness that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because Jesus lived and died and rose again for us. We know that nothing can separate us from God's love. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Love. Affirmation of Faith from the Declaration of Barman. The Christian Church is the congregation of brethren in which Jesus Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrifice through the Holy Spirit. As the Church of Sinners, it has to justify in the midst of a sinful world with its faith as with this obedience, and with this message, as with its order, that it is solely his property, and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction in the expectation of appearance. We reject the false doctrine as through the church is permitted to abandon the form of its message and order its own pleasure and changes in prevailing ideological, political convictions. Please be seated. Our first scripture for the evening is from Exodus. It's a story that is well known to all of us. Exodus, a Greek word for departure or going out. We're very familiar with the story being a major departure of people living a physical place to go to another uncertain physical place. To move from Egypt all the way to the promised land. But there is, I believe, a much broader and deeper meaning for a story today. 
And I'd like to suggest to you, as the beginning of the year, the beginning of a new moderator in our presbytery, that the meaning of the word departure has more to do with leaving conventional wisdom that was so well exhibited by two women in our story today, Sephra and Pua. Both of these women were instructed by Pharaoh to follow clear instructions about what they needed to do. And both of them departed and went away, made a bold statement, risked their lives, and broke from conventional wisdom. It is with this framework that I like for us to listen newly to the Word of God from Exodus. We pick up the story on verse 15. Listen for God's word. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sephra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's the boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, she shall live. But the midwives fear God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they left the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Now why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives fear God, God gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. May God bless our experience, as well as our understanding, the reading of God's word. Before I read the text, I want to thank choir for being here tonight on a cold and wet um, Tuesday evening. I'm grateful you're here. All of you who have stuck it out um, and didn't head home early and all of the church members who have volunteered um, to be here tonight, I, I want to say thank you. It, is, uh, it really is an honor um, to be called to this position. We are reading a text that many of you may have read just after Easter. We're in the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 16 through 23, where we read a similar story to the one of Herod and the boys. So let's listen for the word of the Lord. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel, but when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. 
And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was his uh, kingdom of heaven moment. I don't know how many of you have ever had one of those kingdom of heaven moments where suddenly what seemed cloudy and almost being unable to understand it, you have this clear vision of what God desires of you. This was his moment. His name was Edward V. Ramage, the Reverend Dr. Edward V. Ramage. Now, that name probably means absolutely nothing to any of you, um, but he was the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of the other Birmingham in Alabama. He had gone there in 1946, and this moment of clarity came to him in 1963. Because he was one of the eight pastors who wrote to the Dr. Martin Luther King and said, we do not appreciate you, we do not welcome you, we don't think you should be here doing what you are doing here in Birmingham. And then, Dr. King wrote one of the most amazing pieces of biblical theology. The letter from the Birmingham jail. And Dr. Ramage was one of the people that this letter was addressed to. And when he read it, he was cut to the heart. He had that kingdom of heaven moment where his eyes were opened and he understood the way life ought to be. And with this great and deep insight, he went to his congregation and he began to talk to them about the fact they needed to end segregation. They needed to work for integration. They needed to actually open their church to people of color. And his church rose up and he was gone within six months. <laughs> and, and I know this because he was my childhood pastor. He, he came to the church where in Houston where my family and I were, were members. And he came a defeated, embittered, extraordinarily cautious man. Never again did he talk about integration. Never again did he talk about ending segregation. He had suffered the penalty that comes with standing up to the powers and principalities of this world. And his legacy is just one more reminder, my friends, that the powers and principalities are not going to go down without a fight. The powers and principalities are those, the, those, those people, those communities, those systems that have this deep desire, this deep demonic desire for domination over everyone. They desire to keep everyone under their feet. And, and we can speculate as to the reasons. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's emptiness inside, maybe that they are totally unsure of themselves, but there is this sense that, that the powers, they want to be on top with everyone else underneath them. This is Herod. This is Pharaoh. For those of you who don't know a lot about Herod, Herod was definitely a principality and a power all unto himself. 
It, it was said that it would have been better to be, I think, Herod's dog than a relative. Um, because out of his fear, out of this fear and, and need to make sure he was always on top and he, he was the power. He, he had two of his sons killed. He had a wife killed. He, he had Galileans killed. He, anyone who, who even, he, he even suspected might threaten him, he had done away with. And, and for him, I think it, it just, it, it's this power inside, and, and, and you can sense the emptiness in him because in his last will and testament, he, or, he, he was really afraid. You know what he was afraid of? He was afraid that the day he died, no one would mourn. So, in his last will and testament, what Herod did is he wrote out that that they should take a bunch of the leaders of the city of Jericho and march them out and kill them. Because if they did that, people would really weep. Even if it wasn't for him, it would look like maybe it was for him. I mean, this is this, this sense of sort of this, this inner demonic that, that leads Herod and Pharaoh. You know, kill those baby boys. You just take care of them. And so when, when the story comes that, that Herod sends out his, his minions to, to kill the children in Bethlehem. This would have been Herod's M.O. Any threat, any threat had to be nullified. The principalities and the powers of this world are not going to go down without a fight, and one, and which is why they love pyramids, N not the kind in Giza, where just sort of leave that aside for the moment. They love pyramids, and now, when we think about the pyramid of power, right, w within our own society, we, we always talk about the one percenters, right? A as if you have the one percenters up here and everybody else is down here. But the powers understand that kind of pyramid doesn't really work real well if they're gonna stay the powers. Now, what you need is you need a multi-level pyramid scheme so that you have multi-levels on the pyramid. So that each, on each level of the pyramid, people have somebody to look down on. And as long as they have somebody to look down on, then they're going to be looking down on those people beneath them, and they're not going to be looking up to see sort of where they can move next. And, and there was a fascinating study I read about what happens to people, their attitudes, when they move up just one sort of level in society. And what the study found was most people, regardless of how minor the movement was, looked down on the people who were there, who were, who are where they were. That if someone was homeless and they got into a shelter, they looked down on and criticized people who were homeless. And, and people who were in a shelter and got into subsidized housing, they, they looked down on the people who were in the shelters. And those in subsidized housing, and, and you, you get my drift, it, it, it doesn't take much of anything because somehow we've been taught that we're supposed to live in this world of pyramids in which we are to look down and just look down on them, step on them, crush them. Why? Because we're better. We're better than them. And we get fed this. We get fed this by our society. And you can hear it. You can see it. No, the powers and principalities, they want a world of pyramids. They love pyramids. Which is why they're afraid of circles. They are afraid of circles. Which is why, by the way, they're afraid of the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven 
is a circle. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's a circle. It's a wheel where at the center is the triune God of love and grace and justice. At the center is the risen, reigning, crucified, alive Lord whose love just flows out. At the center is the Holy Spirit who, who is, the, is the spokes that holds the wheel together and makes it run and work. The powers and principalities, they, they're afraid of circles. And so what I'm going to, I really thought about this a lot, but I'm going to ask you, I'm, I'm from Texas. I'm going to ask you all to do something. For those who are able, what I'd like to do is I want to connect you as a chain. Just maybe a hand on a shoulder, or if you want to hold hands, I know the flu's out there, you may not want to hold people's hands. But I'd like you to, to connect up here. Come on, connect up, around, all the way, not just in one pew, but connect up, you guys too, you guys too. I know, asking the choir to hold hands, it's just... You guys are really good. Okay, so, so here's, here's the deal. My high school geometry teacher would not like this, but you're now a circle. <laughs> All right? You are now a circle. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at this circle. Is anyone greater than anyone else in this circle? Is anyone more important than anyone else in this circle? No. And look at, look at what this circle is made up of. This circle is made up of people who are young and people uh, kind of like me who are not so young. It's made up of people whose skin color is different. It is made up of people whose educational levels are different. It is made up of people who come from different churches, who root for different football teams. <laughs> and so the gift of this circle is, is that when one person begins to stumble, the entire circle is there to steady them. When one person falls, we are all there to pick them up. When one person is hungry, we are all there to feed them. This, my friends, this, what we see here tonight, this is an example of the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven. That we are together as, as a multi-gender, multi-racial, multi-age, multi-everything community. That's what they fear. Because when we are together as the circle, and I'm not going to ask you to sing it, <laughs> the circle remains unbroken. Because together we cannot be defeated. The kingdom of heaven is coming. It is coming through us. It is coming through all of us. When we are willing to be a circle and not a pyramid, the kingdom of heaven will be present. Amen. And so my friends, it's up to you. It's up to you. Do you want to be part of a pyramid? Do you want to be part of a circle? And that, that's my challenge to you for this evening. But as you come forward for communion, ask yourself that question. Is my life going to be about building pyramids and looking down on people? Or is my life going to be about building circles and looking across at my brothers and sisters in faith? Let us pray.
Gracious God, we just give you such thanks. Such thanks that, that you call us to be your kingdom, to be citizens of this amazing and wonderful kingdom. Help us to be part of the circle, lifting up those who are falling, supporting those who are weak, feeding those who are hungry, caring for the lost and the lonely. Gracious God, just help us to be a circle, not just now, but always. We pray this in the name of our amazing Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as we are called to one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one We are called by God to be the Church of Jesus Christ, a sign in the world today of what God intends for all humankind. The great ends of the Church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual Christ is to willing, dedicated discipleship. Our discipleship is a manifestation of the new life we enter through baptism. Discipleship is both a gift and a commitment, offering and responsibility. John and Sharon, the grace bestowed on you in baptism is sufficient for your calling because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in the faith and to commit our lives in ways which serve Christ. God has called you to particular service, and please show your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will with God's help. Do you welcome the responsibility of this service because you are determined to follow the Lord Jesus, to love neighbors, and to work for the reconciling of the world? Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit? And a few questions for you all as well. Do you, members of the Presbytery of Detroit, confirm the call of God to our brother John Judson and our sister Sharon Barconi as moderator and vice moderator of the Presbytery of Detroit in the service of Jesus Christ? We do. Will you support and encourage them in this ministry? We will.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading John and Sharon to this time and place. Establish them in your truth and guide them by your Holy Spirit, that in your service they may grow in faith, hope, and love, and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forevermore. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you are called disciples, and by the Holy Spirit, made the one church to serve you. Please bring your spirit to rule our church so that we may be joined in love and service to Jesus Christ, who, having gone before us, is coming to meet us in the promise of your kingdom. now a circle of charge and blessing. John and Sharon, you are installed to service as moderator and vice moderator in the Presbytery of Detroit. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. May the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends.
after the benediction, I'm going to ask you all to take a few minutes and fill out the forms while the choir does its exit thing. Um, and then we will come back for prayers and joys and concerns, and then we will head to our homes. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may the grace mercy and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of you from this moment forward and forevermore. Amen. Amen.